hello and welcome. We are so glad that you found your way back to the nonprofit show, or if this is your first time here, we're glad that you found us for your first time, and we hope that you enjoy it so much that you will join us again. Today, I am thrilled to have with us in conversation, Jeff Shaw. Jeff is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Harris Stowe State University, and Jeff is here to talk to us about people of color and nonprofit fundraising. And so this is definitely a topic that I'm eager to learn from. I already shared with Jeff in our uh, preliminary conversation, you know, I do not have the lived experience in this um, area. And so I am all ears, all eyes, all heart ready to learn uh, from you, Jeff, and really excited to do so. I want to thank Julia Patrick for creating this grandiose concept called The Nonprofit Show. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, taking some much-deserved time away, and I'm honored to serve alongside. And for her, I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. So honored to serve alongside Julia because day in and day out since March, we have produced now nearly 900 episodes also, huge thank you of gratitude goes to our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. These companies, very many, or most of them, I should say, that's better grammar, have been with us from the very beginning and so grateful to have their their trust and their relationship with us to have conversations with uh, thought leaders like Jeff. If you missed any of our episodes or at some point during today's episode with Jeff Shaw, you say, somebody else needs to hear this. I wanna share this conversation with someone else. Good news, we got you, our friends. You can download the app right now. If you're watching, you can scan that QR code code with your phone. We can also listen to us on podcast and streaming broadcast platforms. So I always like to say wherever you like to binge watch or listen to your entertainment, you could probably find us there. So go ahead and pull up the nonprofit show. Jeff, so glad to have you with us. Um, the the preliminary, you know, intro stuff is done and now we're launching into the, the nitty gritty conversation. But for those of you watching and listening, I do want to honor our guest and, and share with you who he is and where he's joining us from. So Jeff Shaw is here, Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Harris Stowe State University. Welcome to you, Jeff. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I also love that nonprofit nerd title. I think that's that's pretty <laughs> pretty cool. You know, for a long time, my, my, my daughter calls me a nerd because I have an IT background. But, you know, I love that title. But, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to uh, to be here today. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm vice president of institutional advancement, Harris State University. Uh, I've been here for two years now, but I've been in the um, higher education space for ooh, close to I want to say close to 20 years now or right at about 20 years now. So, yeah, I've been doing this uh, for a minute, but but very, very happy to be here. So glad to have you. And thank you. One of our first uh, talking points, if you will, is really going to dive us into your entry point into the sector. So, Jeff, let's kick us off. I'd love to learn from you how you broke into the nonprofit fundraising space, what that looked like, and, and as much of the journey as you can tell us in this very truncated timeline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, get ready for an interesting ride because it is an interesting one. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so um, you know, I started off like most people with no interest or even thought of, of being a fundraiser. So my um, my I came out of college with a psychology degree, you know, and uh, most of what I thought is uh, I wanted to help people, you know, from a mental health standpoint. I started off at a, a, a nonprofit that was a, a it was the HIV AIDS hotline. Uh, and I was a crisis counselor. I was a telephone crisis counselor. So that's what I did. Um, and I was very happy to do that because they taught us about counseling and active listening and all of the wonderful things that you do to help people um, when they're going through a particular crisis. And I did that for a while uh, because I felt like that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a counselor. I was a victim advocate. So I was an on-call advocate. I did. Um, I was a domestic violence facilitator. So if people had to go through a domestic violence course for 26 weeks, they came to my class and I, I helped them get through our domestic violence issues. So I did that for a long time. And then all of a sudden, believe it or not, I just decided I wanted to be an IT guy. So uh, I kind of shifted gears and I went back to school 
I got a network administration degree. I got a Microsoft Systems Engineer certification. So I became a full-fledged IT guy. And that's when I started in higher education. I got a job at Florida a and University. They hired me as an IT person um, to basically support their, um, at that time, uh, well, what they call TRIO programs, which is like Upward Bound and College Reach Out and those types of programs that they have at the university. But I knew I wanted to do a little bit more than that. Um, so instead of just working in like a computer lab, I actually applied for a job on campus to support from the IT step level, the advancement department. Now, I didn't know what advancement was. <laughs> at now the time. you do. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to become um, an IT professional in this space of advancement and university relations and be able to support these folks. So almost immediately after I got there, they put me through a training uh, to understand what, you know, like their CRM and like what constituents were and, you know, what um, yeah. moves management and all these different uh, elements of fundraising were so that I could support them from an IT standpoint. So as I'm learning, and this is where my counseling comes in, as I'm learning how to support them, I'm also doing this whole active listening thing. I'm going to everybody saying, so what is your job and what is it that you do? And how can I best support you? So I was using my counseling to help me understand what their needs were so that I can properly support them as an IT professional. And I got to I gotta admit, people looked at me very strangely because they had never met an IT person that actually wanted to sit down and talk to them. <laughs> so so, so they, I, was, I was much a very different type of IT person. But I will say that experience taught me all the different elements of advancement and development and how all those pieces kind of work together into fundraising. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to about 2009, this is about a year after Obama's campaign. Um, I was in a board meeting um, helping out, you know, with the IT needs of our, our foundation board members. And I remember there was this huge conversation about, look at the way Obama was able to utilize mobile technology to really galvanize his base, to raise money, to organize events. And, you know, people could text Obama to these numbers or what have you to do all of these wonderful things. And our board was saying, why can't we leverage that type of technology to help us raise more money? And at the time, you know, mobile giving wasn't really a big thing back then, but I remember my, um, my, my vice president thinking, okay, that's something we'll look into. And right after that board meeting, I went to my, my vice president and I said, hey, you know, why don't you let me use what I know in technology? Let me take on this project and see what I can do to leverage technology to raise more money. So wow. she said, great, Jeff, take it on. So what I did is I, I started looking at the companies that were doing a lot of that stuff for the campaign and things like that. And I found a company called MGive. And at the time, you could text and it would put five dollars on your phone bill and, you know, what have you. But it was very, very new technology back then. And I organized a mobile giving campaign for Florida a University, the very first mobile giving campaign of any university, not just the HBCU, but of any university in the country that had done a mobile giving campaign. If you know anything about FAMU or, or anything about HBCUs, when you look at homecoming, the big thing is the band. It's, it's not necessarily the football team, but the band is like a huge deal at these games. And at that school, their band was a huge, huge deal. So I asked our band director if we can have during the halftime show, them put the, the little call letters, the 50555 on the field during halftime and ask people to pull out their phones and text. And when he did that during homecoming, we ended up getting about 2,000 donors during that halftime show. Wow. So, you know, the, but not, the time it was just $5 donations. So we raised about $10,000, but the fact that we got 2,000 people to engage right. during that event was just phenomenal. My, my boss was very happy, you know, um, you know, things went really well. And after that, my boss said, hey, Jeff, why don't you just become our annual fund person? You can do our direct mails, our phone-a-thon, our you know, our, our email campaigns, just do all of that stuff, you know, just do everything. So um, very soon after that, January of 2010, Haiti got hit with a tsunami. If you remember back in when Haiti got hit with that tsunami yeah. and the entire world were, was trying to text $5 right. to 90999 to help out with Haiti relief. Well, now text to give had become like this global phenomenon where it looks like, oh, now you can raise millions of dollars really quickly using mobile technology. So now other other nonprofits as well as um, colleges and universities start calling 
saying, how can we do this? And they all start referring them to me saying, hey, there's this guy named Jeff in Florida that did this great campaign. If you want to know how to do it, call him. So my phone oh, yeah. starts ringing like crazy because everybody wants to know, how did I do this? Uh -huh. um, so, so now my boss is saying, yeah, you definitely need to be our annual fund person. But wow. keep in mind, I'm still the IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm raising money. So I love this non-traditional route. And I yeah. knew in my heart, Jeff, when you had said active training or active listening for your counseling, I was like, that is very complimentary to fundraising, right? Yeah. Like really having the ability to listen. And I just love hearing your story. So thank you for, for sharing that. And again, oh. like in a very non-traditional way and congratulations sure. on that success because that is fantastic. It, re it really is fantastic. Yeah. You shared with me that your university hasn't always been HBCU. So I'm curious what your donor portfolio looks like, Jeff, especially knowing like, and I remember when I learned the word constituent and I was thinking, what does constituent mean? So you yeah. share the story <laughs> kind of learning through the process as well. But would you share with us, you know, what the makeup of your current portfolio looks like? Yeah, so so our, our HBCU has a very different history from a lot of HBCUs. A lot of each, a lot of HBCUs go back to the late 1890s uh, when they when they got their start as a college specifically for people of color, or at that time they called them Negro colleges um, or, or or Negro schools or normal schools. Well, our our university has roots all the way back to 1857, uh, pre-Civil War. And it was started as an all-white teachers college called Harris Teachers College. So um, it started off that way. But in 1890, they created an, an additional school called Stowe Teachers College, which was for African-American students um, to go to, to also learn how to be teachers. So that went on for a while as two separate uh, schools until about the 1950s, where they integrated Harris Teachers College, and they didn't see a need for the Stowe Teachers College anymore. So they integrated Harris Teachers College, and that became the university. But then they decided that because there was a, a heritage or a history with Stowe Teachers College, let's bring that name back to Harris Teachers College and make it Harris Stowe Teachers College. But then when you get one, well, when we had a president called Dr. Henry Gibbons that served as our president for about 33 years or so, um, in 1987, okay, so in 1987, he decided to apply for the Historically Black College or HBCU designation for the university because we had such a rich history um, as a school for teaching African Americans to be teachers. So we actually changed it to Harris Stowe, brought in the name Harris Stowe, and then we became a university. And that's in 1987, that's when we became an HBCU. So we haven't been an HBCU for the last hundred or so years, like a lot of HBCUs. We recently became an HBCU back in 1987. Wow. Yeah. That is fascinating. I mean, just, just learning through that. So your portfolio, then there's a mixture and I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming, which we know we're, we shouldn't assume yeah. you have a broad spectrum, perhaps donors from the previous university, like, like yeah. understanding that previous history is that, and do you have all, all age, all ethnicities? Is your portfolio just a diverse makeup? Yeah. So when you look at the portfolio, depending on how many years you go back, um, you know, you start going back 30, 40 years, you have graduates of Harris Teachers College. Right. You have some who are graduates of Stowe yeah. Teachers College. <laughs> you have some that are graduates of Harris Stowe Teachers College. And then the more recent graduates, they remember when it changed from Harris Stowe College to Harris Stowe State University. So, you know, we have a, a, a diverse uh, group of folks that had a very different experience because for a long time, Harris Stowe was only a teacher's college. Um, it wasn't until um, maybe like the late 90s when we brought on like a business school and arts and sciences and these other programs. And now we just started a, a, a program in STEM. So the older alums don't know anything about that. They just remember it being a teacher's college. And like I said, sometimes, you know, you're looking at an all white population, depending on what school they went to, or you meet some folks that actually were in a diverse situation. So it's yeah. it it kind of runs runs the gambit. Yeah. That's fantastic. And then as it runs the gamut, I'm curious what you're measuring. And if you're measuring any different results based off of 
uh, your donors, if, you know, if they are people of color, but what we just learned is really your portfolio base is just as diverse as, as the United States, right? Really looking yeah. at uh, those that you serve. So are you measuring different results? So, you know, as opposed to measuring different results based upon uh, color, as far as our constituents, uh, when they give, we're not really measuring that. Um, we're not tracking that in our system of, you know, who's giving that's African-American or who's giving that's Caucasian or anything like that. However, I will say something that has been very noticeable in the area of HBCUs and in the past few years, what we've seen is that, you know, there's always been talk about um, equity in fundraising or equity in philanthropy and whether or not the HBCUs are receiving the same type of funding as their counterparts that are at predominantly white institutions and things like that. And I, this is my third HBCU. So I've worked at three different HBCUs. So I've seen where HBCUs typically have to fight to get certain funds or, 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 or work really hard to, to reach out to certain foundations and get some of those same type dollars that we've seen at other institutions. But in the last few years, with particularly with things like COVID, um, um, George Floyd, um, you know, Michael Brown, those types of situations where there's racial diversity, racial uh, disparities, uh, social injustice, those types of things have brought um, those racial discrepancies to the forefront to where now the HBCUs are starting to see funding from sources that they weren't seeing before. Um, there are foundations and, and, and corporations that are reaching out to HBCUs now saying, how can I help? What can we do? What can we do to, to create some type of equity and we're starting to see an uh, influx of funds that we haven't seen before. Now, I'm not trying to say that um, there's a level playing field now, but I am saying that there's more resources now than there were in the past because I think uh, culturally there's been a shift in the priorities of making things a little bit more equitable and uh, diverse when it comes to funding now. Yeah. You know, that's very interesting that you say that. And and we, Julia and I, the, that's the we, we've been talking a lot over the last four years about the pandemics, plural, and including the social injustice as, you know, one of the pandemics we're facing and really looking how people have started, we hope, to diversify, you know, where they fund and, and really adding maybe um, some additional funding, you know, areas of focus. And so hearing what you just shared, one, it, it makes me happy. Do you feel that these funds are, um, are here to stay? Is this something that, you know, uh, it's even a hard question for me to ask, but I hope that people aren't just putting money to say, this is what we're doing and that it will be a long time relationship. Are you seeing these relationships extend? Well, what, one of the things that, and this is part of my job and what I do, is that, you know, I look at donors as partners um, and, and I try to think of them as partners and not as transactions. So anytime we make a connection with a corporation or foundation or someone that's working with us, we want to include them as a partner at the university, which means it's our job to make that relationship feel more like a partnership so that it doesn't just be a one time gift or one time fun type of situation because we want to make you a partner. We want to we want to invite you to our events. We want you to be a part of what's going on at the university. We want you to take a tour of what's going on. We want to let you know how we're using our funds and how it's impacting our students. So that way it feels more like a relationship than a transaction. So that's on us now. The other part, um, like you said, uh, we hope that um, it's not a one-time thing because we know that because of certain things that happen in our culture, sometimes the priorities do shift. Just like I mentioned with Haiti, sometimes there's a natural disaster and all of a sudden everybody switches their funding priorities because they feel like something else might be more important at the time. So we're hoping that's not the case. You know, we've seen things like um, um, in the situations where, you know, a lot of universities have started to receive um um, a lot of like multi-million dollar funds um, coming from different sources that they haven't seen before and they're unrestricted funds. They're saying, hey, you know, hey, here's something that you can use. We've seen that kind of thing happen. We don't know how long that will continue, but right. that has definitely been transformational for a lot of different HBCUs. So that has been uh, that has been something that's been very worthwhile. But I can definitely say that on our part and most of HBCUs, once we see those types of funds coming in, if we could turn those things into relationships and not transactions, we can keep that, that, that whole piece going. My fingers are crossed for you, my friend. So those of you that are watching, you probably saw me cross my fingers. Those of you listening, cross yours too, because I think, I think it will all help. 
Um, I love that you mentioned relationship and I could not echo that, you know, louder and, and more boisterous for you. I also subscribe to that because the transactional is just not where it's at. It's not sustainable. Right. Uh, let's move to our final talking point because sadly our time's coming, coming to an end here shortly. That was fast, wasn't it? It goes by so fast, <laughs> especially a conversation like this, Jeff. Um, yeah. I'm curious, and I'm going to take this more into the relational side as well. Can you talk to us about challenges maybe that you're facing to really recruit young people of color into the sector, into fundraising, into, you know, maybe even higher education and working at HBCUs? I feel that, and and I know I'm, you know, I'm, I'm starting this off with like my perspective, but I feel that just as as fundraising is, recruiting is relationship based as well. So mm -hmm. what are you seeing in this space? Yeah, so I think now in this particular space, I don't think we're that dissimilar from a lot of um a lot of other um people in this nonprofit space because I think just the whole concept of fundraising is kind of is is kind of an anomaly to a lot of people. They just they just don't know, or maybe I should say an enigma, one of those words works, right? <laughs> but um, I just think that because people don't fully understand what fundraising is, it's something that they just kind of overlook or don't even want to be a part of. I know I was the same way. Like when I was more so on the IT side and I was doing more of the technical side of what they call advancement services as it relates to fundraising, I was comfortable with that because I said, I never want to be that guy going around asking for money. I don't want to be that guy. You know, and because I thought that guy was the person that had to go around knocking on doors and begging people to give him money and, you know, that pressure of trying to get somebody to make a gift. And I just felt like that wasn't something I wanted to do. However, as I learned more and more about what philanthropy and that whole understanding of what fundraising is, it's really just bringing people, um, connecting people with their passions for the things that they want to do or the change that they want to make in the world. And you making those things happen and creating those connections between your university and their passions, then they thank you for being able to bring that kind of stuff together. You're not begging. You're just creating those opportunities for the things that people already want to do. So once I understood that, fundraising became a whole different thing to me. And I think the more we're able to make people aware or especially our young people aware of this is a career that's a very viable career. It's a very rewarding career, um, but it's not what you think it is. It's actually something totally different that talks to people's passions and allows you to be your authentic self without having to create some, you know, I'm this salesperson kind of person. Um, then we'll get more people into the business. And I think with a lot of the stuff that I do, because I'm on like our AFP, our local AFP board, and I go out and do, I, I speak to people at different places. And one of the things that, one of my challenges is I do want to talk to young people and get in front of more young people to talk about how this whole, um, you know, this whole area of development and advancement works, because it's definitely been a life changer for me. And I think it'd be a life changer for a lot of people if they just kind of understood more about it. You know, I, I so appreciate your perspective on that. And you're right. I feel that fundraising has become the F word that no one wants to talk about. And it's like, it's really, I love fundraising. And similar to you, Jeff, I really look at it from that relationship space. It's an opportunity to bring people with you to make a positive difference. Mm -hmm. um, one of my great friends, LaShonda Williams, she's watching and listening. So you yes. might go, you might I know, know. Jeff. <laughs> She says, thanks, Jarrett and Jeff, for another great show. Professional fundraising recruitment in the African-American community is taboo. Although African-Americans are philanthropic and support their religious organizations, family members and, um, and uh, members in crisis, et cetera. So thank you, LaShonda, for your compliment and your additional comment. It is uh, much appreciated and welcome. And LaShonda always has a very nice way of saying, um, you know, really what a fundraiser is and, and, and what they do. And, and I'm not even going to attempt to paraphrase it, um, but really giving people the opportunity, you know, to, to do good. And, and yeah. a lot of people, like you said, Jeff, they say, thank you. Like, thank yeah. you for allowing me this opportunity to do, to do good. Um, this is just, that was, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that was, I think that was a shock for me because my, my first real chance to do like face-to-face -face major gift fundraising was when my, when my boss retired and I kind of took on, I was the annual giving person. And I took on some of her, her, her um, donors to just kind of move things along after her retirement until we found a new replacement. And I remember the first time I closed on an endowment, 
And the family invited me to their home to do like signing of the paperwork. And once we signed everything, like everybody was coming around to thank me and shake my hand and saying, thank you so much. And I'm saying to myself, wow, you guys are giving our university money, but you're thanking me. You know, it was like, that was like my, my mind changing moment that said, okay, the work that I'm doing here is not begging for money at all. This is something totally different where I'm fulfilling people's passions and just kind of making those things come into fruition. And that's so much more rewarding than going around begging people for money, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Just hearing that gives me chills. And I really hope that everyone in this space gets an opportunity to experience that themselves because what a powerful moment and, and a really beautiful moment. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And you're right. I think this sector at large is facing many challenges to re recruit uh professionals, young professionals, you know, into this space. So I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. Jeff, we could talk for hours, or I know <laughs> I would love to talk to you for hours and continue this conversation. But for those of you watching and listening, please help me thank Jeff Shaw. He is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement. And if you joined us early, you learned that at one point in his life, he did not know what advancement meant. He, he, he merely served them from an IT capacity and really started learning um, what all advancement meant through his active listening skills. So Jeff, thank you for your service and for um, serving at Harris Stowe State University. For those of you that want to check out Harris Stowe, you can find them at hssu.edu. And um, Jeff, I'm curious, are you also active on LinkedIn? Because I like to point people that direction too. Yes, I'm actually active on LinkedIn. You can find me at Jeff Shaw uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm very active on there. I try to post as often as I can. So yes, I'm not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Julia Patrick will be out this week, but I'm holding down the fort, or as I like to say, when the cat's away, the mice will play. But I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd. And our partners that I want to extend our gratitude to are Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. We encourage you to check out these companies. I just think they're divine. They really are also here in a partnership uh, matter, and they want to help you, all of you, in a, in and around and throughout all communities do more good. So Jeff, as, as I shared earlier, we're coming up on, believe it or not, 900 episodes uh, next month, October, and we have signed off all episodes with this same mantra, and I'm going to share it with you today and all of those that are watching and listening. And we ask you, we encourage you, we remind you and invite you to stay well so you can continue to do well. Thank you so much, Jeff. What an honor. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.